Hey there, and welcome back to the Fully Live Athlete Pastor channel. This is Justin, and we are on day 71 of the online Bible reading club. We're looking at Deuteronomy 16, 17, and 18, and we're also looking at Mark 13 now, verses 1 through 20. And we're really going to spend a lot of time digging into Mark, uh, particularly one particular phrase, which is called the abomination that causes desolation or the abomination of desolation. So let's look at it today. Now, we're going to just briefly hit on Deuteronomy, really, today. We've spent a lot of time usually going through the Old Testament passages uh, because that's where a lot of need is usually uh, felt on how to understand the Bible. So it's reading through the Bible in our plan which is linked underneath the video every time uh, if you need to, if you need to re, uh, check it. But we're just going through uh, Old Testament, several chapters a day, and the New Testament as well. Uh, as you look at, we're working through Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. The people have journeyed from slavery in Egypt, been set free through God's miraculous uh, work at the Red Sea. Uh, Moses has led them for 40 years through the wilderness in a journey that should not have taken that long at all. I mean, we're talking two weeks max, and it's a millions of people out there, and they've been counted again. Uh, they've, they've really lost almost nobody uh, in the journey, but they've lost everybody. Uh, they have seen everyone die in uh, the older generation due to curses, but the new generation has replaced them, and they are going to need to know what it is to be holy as God is holy. So in this chapter we look at 16, it talks about the big three festivals, which uh, the chief of which is Passover, of course, which I'm just referring to, the Red Sea crossing. Passover instituted to celebrate how God's wrath passed over them. Why did God's wrath pass over them uh, in Egypt and the uh, plague of the firstborn son only touched those who were not covered in the blood? Well, because God made a promise to Abraham to give his people uh, a land and to bring them into this promised land and make them a, a blessing to the nations. And so this is what he promised to do. It's his covenant promise. Uh, and that's why uh, you can place blood on a door and they're passed over. The wrath of God's passed over. It's not because they put blood on a door. Ultimately, it's because God is faithful to his promise that blood did not save them you know what saves them the blood of the covenant redeemer the actual blood of the covenant redeemer and that's jesus and how do we see jesus in the old testament well, one of the ways we see him in the old testament is through the tri offices the, the three offices of prophets priests and kings those are the three big leadership offices in the old covenant and you see that Jesus embodies all three of those offices in one person there's nobody in the Old Testament that embodied all three offices of the Redeemer Melchizedek who we saw in Genesis uh, is a kind of mysterious figure but he was both a king and a priest though not in the nation of Israel proper and as you see, uh, one man was going to be uh, the mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who would be without sin, uh, a priest who did not need to atone for his own sins, Jesus Christ. Uh, and you see the, the, the regulations about the Levites and how they're going to be in the text that we see today. Uh, the Levites would be caring for the temple, and tabernacle, etc. And they would be governing the sacrifices and whatnot and taking care of all that stuff. But Jesus is going to uh, fulfill all those things in his sacrificial death. You see, as he dies and breathes his last, uh, there is a great disturbance of the heavens and also the veil of the temple that separates the Holy of Holies from the holy places and, the, and the, the common areas of the temple is torn into from the top down, symbolizing our access to God. So we don't need a priest to go before us. We don't need a mediator. We need to pray through any kind of priest. We go directly to the throne. Priest is fulfilled in Christ. Also, the king. The king was to be underneath the word of God. Now, you got to note that. The kings are going to have all kind of rights, but they are limited in their rights. They're going to be the, the shepherd of the people. They're going to uh, care for the people underneath them, right? 
And then ultimately that's going to be seen in, in Saul and David and Solomon and so on and so forth. Well, none of them are perfect. None of them were, were truly embodying this. None of them were totally underneath God's word. And the king that was going to be under God's word is going to be Jesus. He's going to come and say, hey, I came to do only my father's will. I came to do exactly what he told me to do. I am listening to him. I do what he says. This is the true king, the one who lays down his life for his people to care for them underneath God's word, not to take glory for himself. Satan tempted him with the kingdom without suffering uh, in, the, in, uh, in the wilderness in Matthew 4. Unlike the, the Israelite kings, Jesus passed the test. And then you think about the prophets, and you're going to see that uh, in this text, uh, the force of Deuteronomy, the people are going to go into the land, and they're going to hear from they're going to hear of cities where everyone's into this astrology and, and sorcery, and and all the necromancy and and, and listening to the to the spirits, and uh, th this is something that they're not to engage in. And there were false prophets who would uh, tempt the people and tell them the. Uh, what they wanted to hear. And, and you see even in the New Testament, there's warnings against uh, listening to what people uh, will tell you that you want to hear rather than what God's Word says. And so we're to listen to God's revealed Word through the actual prophets who don't lie and don't contradict themselves and don't just tell us what we want to hear. They tell us God's truth. And uh, ultimately the prophets could not uh, reveal uh, the will of God in all its fullness until Christ came. The last prophet before Christ was John the Baptist, and he was preparatory, saying, here is the one to come, and the one who will make God's will known to us ultimately is Jesus Christ. The prophets saw uh, not the whole picture. They brought part of it. Jesus brings the complete picture to us as the true prophet. So all three of these offices are going to be integral in the life of the people. Uh, now, one of those prophets in the Old Testament was Daniel. And when you want to think about interpreting New Testament prophecies, like the text we have before us in Mark 13 and Revelation, you've got to know the Old Testament. You can't, you can't just read the newspaper and think, well, look, it's Obama or it's, uh, it's uh, Iraq or, or North Korea or China or Donald Trump or whatever. Like You can't just start looking at your current situation and think, well, Okay, this is what that means. Well, no, because that's not what it means. It has nothing to do with what you're thinking about. Read the scriptures and then let the scriptures unfold the meaning of these texts. Like, we're going to look at this phrase, abomination of desolation. So, as you think about what that means, it might be helpful to think about where is that in scripture. And if you want to go look it up, you might see that Daniel 9.27 speaks of this abomination of desolation. In context, it's talking about the covenant redeemer who is going to be cut. He's going to be the one who's faithful to the covenant, but he is going to be cut for our sake or pierced. And with that, it says that Daniel's going to assure uh, us that uh, this would not mean the failure of his mission. When was the redeemer cut? Ultimately, this is going to be Christ. And that's not the failure of his mission, but that's the accomplishment of his mission. And this abomination of desolation, which uh, was set up in the temple in uh, Daniel 9, 27, and also in Mark 13, 14, as they're talking about the destruction of the temple, he's going to say, in that day, when you see the, the emperor uh, or the Caesar come in there and start uh, putting up his own image to be worshipped in the temple, that would be one example of the desolation that causes abomination, desolation of the temple. Uh, and that could refer to that by the Romans in 70 AD. But ultimately that anticipates the consummate defamation of the true worship of God by the Antichrist. This is going to be a continual thing that we're going to deal with, the desecration of the true worship of God, and you see it every single week in church buildings everywhere. And you see it every single place every, all over the world. It is a reality, and if you want to ask more questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about it. I don't want to get derailed here, but look, just because you see that, what Jesus says is don't fear that the mission is failing. This is actually part of the plan. It's going to be uh, an absolute devastation for false worship 
uh, the temple worship that had been corrupted, it will be destroyed. He says, run for the hills. It's going to get really ugly. And as you think about this, he says, well, how do you know when this uh, event is going to occur? Well, you're going to be tried by kings. And ultimately, this, this event will, will, will foreshadow the end of all of the, our days and the coming of the Lord. So how do you know it's going to come? There's going to be opposition. You're going to be questioned, disciples who are standing there next to Jesus. And he says, but God will prepare you to say the things that, that he calls you to say. And these things must happen because the gospel must be preached to the whole world. And as, as, you, as you see, Rome is part of this whole world. You're going to be challenged. And you're going to be facing persecution. But that doesn't mean the mission has failed. Some of us will be hated and killed for our faith, just like Jesus. That does not mean the mission has failed. That means the mission is on course. We're being faithful to the Word of God if we are being uh, hated and put to death sometimes by this, this world that stands in opposition. Because I remember back when we talked about Genesis, the very beginning, it's a bloodbath. There is uh, mortal combat going on. The enemy is striking at the Redeemer and the Redeemer is crushing and pushing down the serpent, ultimately to crush his head. And that's what Romans 16.20, the benediction says, is the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And that's coming. That's an that's a echo of Genesis 3.15. Well, I hope that's helpful to you. The abomination that causes desolation. Don't look to the current events to instruct you. Look to the Old Testament prophets and let that interpret you. That's also a good uh, rule of thumb for interpreting the book of Revelation which we will get there, maybe in December, uh, we'll get there. But keep at it, guys. Uh, love doing this with you. If you're watching all the way to the end, go ahead and hit the like button. We'll see you next time. Peace.